As we mentioned earlier, one big problem when it comes to preventing a COVID resurgence is the fact that millions of Americans simply refuse to get vaccinated. Some of them just don't want to be told what to do. Others believe former President Trump's claims that COVID isn't really that dangerous. And then there is the shockingly widespread belief that those life-saving vaccines are actually part of some nefarious plot. A year ago, one poll found that 44% of Republicans thought Bill Gates was using COVID vaccination to implant microchips in people and track their movements. More recent polling shows that 42% of Americans still believe that or some other COVID conspiracy theory. Obviously, that claim is false, laughably so, but that doesn't mean it'll go away. After all, a dispiriting number of Americans also believe man-made climate change is a hoax, and even that the Earth is flat. So when people deny science and put the rest of us in the, at risk in the process, what's the best way to respond? That is a question my next guest has been pondering at length. Lee McIntyre is a research fellow at Boston University's Center for Philosophy and History of Science, and he is the author of the new book, How to Talk to a Science Denier, Conversations with Flat Earthers, Climate Deniers, and Others Who Defy Reason. Lee, thank you for being here. Thank you so much for having me on. You start off your book uh, taking us into a Flat Earther conference that you went to in 2018, I believe. I had not known that Flat Earthism was a whole big belief system, but as you explain, it is. Just for starters, can you describe some of the things that these people believe in addition to the fact, uh, or not the fact, the, the idea <laughs> that the Earth is flat? Yes. Um, they believe that the Earth is flat, uh, which means that uh, a couple of other things have to fall in place, like what's at the edge? Well, they think that Antarctica is not a continent. It's an ice wall that's spread out around the edge uh, to keep the water from falling off. They think that there's a dome over the uh, top of the Earth, uh, which, by the way, makes air travel, uh, makes space travel impossible. So they also believe that we've never been to the moon. Uh, they think that the, uh, the sun and the stars and the moon are, in fact, very close and revolve around the Earth uh, rather than us revolving around the sun. So it, it's, you know, it's like the flat Earth is just the first pebble in the pond, and then there are a number of other things that come with that. They're conspiracy theorists, and when you believe one conspiracy theory, you tend to believe a number of them. You went there uh, in part because you wanted to see if you could convince these people that they were wrong. How did that go? Um, I went there to learn what they thought, and then, if possible, to use that to try to then talk with science deniers. So my goal wasn't necessarily to convert somebody on the spot, because that's which is great, but it's almost impossible to do. So the first day, I was just quiet. I just listened, uh, wore my flannel shirt, had my badge, and I just listened to what they had to say. And then the second day, I started to talk to them. And the frustrating thing is you can't present any facts from Galileo or otherwise that will convince them. So if you're going to do it, you have to try to do it another way. Let's get to that other way in one second. But you described taking a guy who you were impressed with, who you thought was very bright, out to dinner and, and posing to him that famous Karl Popper question, what piece of evidence would force you to conclude that you are in fact wrong? And he couldn't do it. Right? He, he could not take that leap right. and say, there is something that would, in fact, make me give this up. Yeah, it's, it's a great question. As you point out, it's not my question. Because if you're, the flat earthers maintain that their beliefs are based on evidence, not based on faith. And they'll think that they're more scientific than the scientists. But if that's true, then they have to be able to say in advance, what evidence, if I had it in my back pocket, if I could show it to them, would force them to give up their beliefs? And that fella at dinner, he wanted to be able to answer me. But the more we went around to different things that might convince him, uh, he backed off to every single one until it was finally clear, not only to me, but I think to him, that nothing could change his mind. And one of the things that I took away from, from your book, there was actually a page where I said, aha, because I felt like you'd put your finger on something so vital. It's, it's not just about the belief in question. It's about the rush that comes from feeling like you've accessed sort of secret knowledge that the rest mm -hmm. of the world lacks. And the sense of community that that can give you, especially if in other areas of your life, you have felt like a victim or you felt alienated. Yes. I think it was that that made me say, he's got it. 
Yeah, that, that's that you put your finger on exactly the thing to understand science denial. People are always asking, how can they believe these things? Um, it's because it's not about facts. It's about identity. Um, the Flat Earth Convention is where they go to build their identity, to talk to other people who believe the thing that they believe. And far and away, more than one person, in fact, I, I would say most of the people I spoke with spoke of the movie The Matrix, where they saw themselves as part of an elite who had, you know, quote unquote, taken the red pill, now understood reality as it was, and, and their job was to convince the others. And the, the funny part was that as I was trying to convince them that they were wrong, they were trying to convince me that I was wrong because they kept saying, be careful, we used to be just like you, we used to be globalists, and then, you know, we swallowed the red pill. Globalists being their term for people who believe that the earth that's the that. nice term that they use okay. there are some slurs as well which i can't say there's a whole bunch more i want to ask you but let's cut to maybe the most important question uh for viewers who might have friends or family who are uh convinced that covid vaccines are going to change their dna or get a bill gates microchip into them or for viewers who might have friends or family who just reject the idea of uh, human-driven climate change whole cloth. What is an effective way to try to get those people to think twice, maybe change their mind, if in fact they are not big on contravening evidence no. and they have this powerful sense of community? How do you go about trying to reach them? There was a brilliant study in Nature Human Behavior a few years ago, uh, which showed that it is actually effective to talk to science deniers. If you're a, a scientist, you can talk about facts, but if you're not, uh, there are other things that you can do. The main thing that you need to do is to listen and not be insulting. Um, and then the, this is going beyond the evidence a little bit, but to my experience, you have to really uh, have some empathy for them. Remember that they're victims of disinformation. They didn't come up with these uh, uh, problems uh, off their own head. Uh, science denial isn't a mistake, it's a lie. And so somebody has made this up and has it in mind for other people to believe it. And so that will maybe kind of work your empathy a little bit. Um, if you're talking to a friend or family, a family member, that's the best way to convince them because uh, it's really about trust. Um, if science deniers are suspicious, and if you can emphasize your relationship with them, listen, ask questions. Sometimes they'll convince themselves that they're wrong. You can't change somebody's mind for them. You can create an opportunity for them to change their mind, and you do that through patience, respect, which is very hard. It's very hard. I mean, I fought this when I was at the Flat Earth Convention. I really wanted to debunk them. It would have been so satisfying, but that is not the long game. And that's not how you convince somebody that you love to get a COVID shot. You suggest at times a method that almost reminded me of, of fishing, where you're, you're not sort of suggesting things to them that they might want to think about, but asking these people, well, can you, can you give me something to think about? What's a piece of evidence that you mm -hmm. find especially compelling to support this, to all appearances, very strange idea that you have? Yeah, and, and that, that's another good strategy, right? Because if you ask them those sorts of questions, they will tell you what they think. You know, they'll offer you, you don't just have to read a script that you got off the internet. They'll tell you the sorts of things that they think and then engage in a conversation. Um, if, as long as you can keep them talking and it's respectful, uh, you've got a, a good chance. And you know what? Uh, one really good strategy to convince somebody is to try to get them to convince you. You know, ask them, well, why shouldn't I get my COVID shot? And then they start bringing something up and you say, well, could you have any evidence for that? How do you know that that's true? Can, can you show me your source? Eventually, they'll get frustrated because they, in fact, don't have the evidence to convince you. And that creates what psychologists call cognitive dissonance in their mind. And sometimes that brings them around. You talked a moment ago about people who believe these things being victims of disinformation. One of the points that you make in the book is that in some cases, uh, not all, they are the victims of disinformation driven at an extremely high level. And you cite the example of the tobacco industry back in, I think, the, the 50s or thereabouts, yes. working extremely hard to convince people that cigarettes were totally safe when the science had indicated that, in fact, they were not. And I think we have some visuals. 
I hope I'm right about this, of a Stanford medicine video showing some really remarkable images of uh, ad campaigns aimed at getting people to do exactly that. I'm not sure if we do have those visuals or not. Oh, uh, forgive me, we have a soundbite. Let's take a look and a listen. Scientists with a laboratory behind them. And very often they quoted scientific studies that were completely invalid. Often they were paid for by the industry to make a specific point rather than to ask a question. And that these were very simplistically put out as scientific findings about the safety of their tobacco product. Again, that's a, a curated video from Stanford Medicine. Uh, in your experience, when it comes to the, the range of pernicious types of science denial, how many, uh, how many subgroups have just sort of sprung up organically, maybe like flat earthers, and how many have been driven by big real life conspiracies to get us, believe some, to, yeah. to get us to believe something that's false? It's, it's really hard to know. Um, I would say that when people talk about science denial as an umbrella, it's important to remember there are many things that fall under that. There's flat earth, there's evolution denial, there's anti-vax, there's climate denial. Some of those have been politicized, some of them haven't. Uh, some of the people behind it, it, like cigarettes or climate change, it's about money, right? That's the interest. It's corporate money. In some cases, it's ideological interest. And then there are some cases where you just can't, for the life of you, figure out who's making a buck on this or, you know, who wants somebody to believe false information. But it is almost always the case that these things do not spring up organically. Even, I'll give you an example. Even if they're made up as a hoax, even if it's a joke, um, uh, so there's no interest behind it other than, you know, to make fun of someone. Uh, that's sometimes how they get started. There's there's one that started the other day uh, um, uh, that birds aren't real, that birds, yeah. all yeah. the birds died years ago and they're just drones and they're looking down and it's spying on us. Now, that was made up uh, as a joke. That was made up to make fun of. It was, uh, uh, to, you know, to make fun of science deniers. But wouldn't you know it? some people now believe that it's true. So, I mean, the irony feeding back on itself that the person who made it up, it was a joke, but then real science deniers start to believe it. Well, and that again speaks to the, the emotional rush that comes from thinking that yes. you've pulled back the curtain. Um, really briefly, I, I'm sure we're gonna have people watching saying to themselves, that's all well and good. The idea of talking patiently and empathetically with someone who believes mm -hmm. this is not science, but you know, uh, that there are networks bringing pedophiles into the US Capitol, that kind of thing. Or that, yeah. that vaccines are, are uh, you know, evil and, and are being used to entrap us. Mm -hmm. But I only have so much time in my life. I have a job, yeah. I have a family, I want to sleep, I need to be able to tune out. Why is it important to engage in the sort of deep conversation that you're discussing? It's the only thing that works, and science denial is growing. It's getting worse. I think that the thing that led to what I call post-truth, the political subordination of reality, the you know uh, about voting or the January 6th insurrection, came from 60 or 70 years of science denial being very successful. And people looking at that and saying, wow, if you can deny the truth about cigarette smoking or about climate change, you can deny the truth about anything. So, the stakes, so we have to deal yeah. with it now. All right, Lee McIntyre, thank you for being here to talk about it. It's a fascinating book and um, incredibly timely, for better or worse. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. I enjoyed it.